The Story of Civilization, Volume 2, The Life of Greece, Part 1, by Will Durant. Continued, Cassette 7, Side 2. Sculpture in relief was so old that a pretty legend could undertake to describe its origin. A lass of Corinth drew upon a wall the outline of the shadow that the lamplight cast of her lover's head. Her father, Butides, a potter, filled in the outline with clay, pressed the form to hardness, took it down, and baked it. So, Pliny assures us, bas-relief was born. The art became even more important than sculpture in the adornment of temples and graves. Already in 520, Aristocles made a funeral relief of Aristion, which is one of the many treasures of the Athens Museum. Since reliefs were nearly always painted, sculpture, relief, and painting were allied arts, usually handmaids to architecture, and most artists were skilled in all four forms. Temple moldings, friezes, metopes, and pediment backgrounds were usually painted, while the main structure was ordinarily left in the natural color of the stone. Of painting as a separate art we have only negligible remains from Greece, but we know through passages in the poets that panel painting, with colors mixed in melted wax, was already practiced in the days of Anacreon. Painting was the last great art to develop in Greece, and the last to die. All in all, the sixth century failed to rise, in any Greek art except architecture, to the boldness of conception or the perfection of form attained in the same age by Greek philosophy and poetry. Perhaps artistic patronage was slow to develop in an aristocracy still rural and poor, or in a business class too young to have graduated from wealth to taste. Nevertheless, the age of the dictators was a period of stimulation and improvement in every Greek art, above all under Pisistratus and Hippias in Athens. Towards the end of this period, the old rigidity of sculpture began to thaw, the rule of frontality was broken down, legs began to move, arms to leave the side, hands to open up, faces to take on feeling and character, bodies to bend in a variety of poses revealing new studies in anatomy and action. This revolution in sculpture, this animation of stone with life, became a major event in Greek history. The escape from frontality was one of the signal accomplishments of Greece. Egyptian and Oriental influences were set aside, and Greek art became Greek. 3. Architecture The science of building recovered slowly from the Dorian invasion, and redeemed beyond its deserts the Dorian name. Across the Dark Age from Agamemnon to Terpander, the Mycenaean Megaron transmitted the essentials of its structure to Greece. The rectangular shape of the building, the use of columns within and without, the circular shaft and simple square capital, the triglyphs and metopes of the entablature, were all preserved in the greatest achievement of Greek art, the Doric style. But whereas Mycenaean architecture was apparently secular, devoted to palaces and homes, classical Greek architecture was almost entirely religious. The royal Megaron was transformed into a civic temple as monarchy waned and religion and democracy united the affections of Greece in honoring the personified city and its god. The earliest Greek temples were of wood or brick, as befitted the poverty of the Dark Age. When stone became the orthodox material of temple building, the architectural features remained as set by timber construction. The rectangular naos, or temple proper, the circular shafts, the master beam architraves, the beam-end triglyphs, the gabled roof, confessed the wooden origin of their form. Even the first ionic spiral was apparently a floral figure painted upon a block of wood. The use of stone increased as Greek wealth and travel grew. The transition was most rapid after the opening of Egypt to Greek trade about 660 B.C. Limestone was the favored material of the new styles before the 6th century. Marble came in towards 580, at first for decorative portions, then for facades, finally for the entire temple from base to tiles. Three orders of architecture were developed in Greece, the Doric, the Ionic, and in the 4th century, the Corinthian. Since the interior of the temple was reserved for the god and his ministrants, and worship was held outside, all three orders devoted themselves to making the exterior impressively beautiful. They began at the ground, usually in some elevated place, with the stereobate, two or three layers of foundation stone in receding steps. From the uppermost layer, or stylobate, rose directly, without individual base, the Doric column, fluted, with shallow, sharp-edged grooves, and widening perceptibly at the middle in what the Greeks called entasis, or stretching. Furthermore, the Dora column tapered slightly towards the top, thereby emulating the tree, and successfully contradicting the Minoan Mycenaean style. 
an undiminished shaft, worse yet one that tapers downward, seems top-heavy and graceless to the eye, while the wider base heightens that sense of stability which all architecture should convey. Perhaps, however, the Dora column is too heavy, too thick in proportion to its height, too stolidly engrossed in sturdiness and strength. Upon the Dora column sat its simple and powerful capital, a necking or circular band, a cushion-like echinus, and topmost a square abacus to spread the supporting thrust of the pillar beneath the architrave. While the Dorians were developing this style from the Megaron, modified probably by acquaintance with the Egyptian proto-Dora colonnades of Der el Bari and Beni Hassan, the Ionian Greeks were altering the same fundamental form under Asiatic influence. In the resultant Ionic order, a slender column rose upon an individual base and began at the bottom as it ended at the top with a narrow fillet or band. Its height was usually greater and its diameter smaller than in the Doric shaft. The upward tapering was scarcely perceptible. The flutings were deep, semicircular grooves separated by flat edges. The Ionic capital was composed of a narrow echinus, a still narrower abacus, and between them, almost concealing them, emerged the twin spirals of a volute, like an enfolded scroll, a graceful element adapted from Hittite, Assyrian, and other Oriental forms. These characteristics, together with the elaborate adornment of the entablature, described not only a style, but a people. They represented in stone the Ionian expressiveness, suppleness, sentiment, elegance, and love of delicate detail, even as the Doric order conveyed the proud reserve, the massive strength, the severe simplicity of the Dorian. The sculpture, literature, music, manners, and dress of the rival groups differed in harmony with their architectural styles. Dorian architecture is mathematics. Ionian architecture is poetry, both seeking the durability of stone. The one is Nordic, the other Oriental. Together they constitute the masculine and feminine themes in a basically harmonious form. Greek architecture distinguished itself by developing the column into an element of beauty as well as a structural support. The essential function of the external colonnade was to uphold the eaves and to relieve the walls of the naos or inner temple from the outward thrust of the gabled roof. Above the columns rose the entablature, that is, the superstructure of the edifice. Here again, as in the supporting elements, Greek architecture sought a clear differentiation and yet an articulated connection of the members. The architrave, the great stone that connected the capitals, was in the Doric order plain or carried a simple painted molding. In Ionic it was composed of three layers, each projecting below, and was topped with a marble cornice segmented with a confusing variety of ornamental details. Since the sloping beams that made the framework of the roof in the Doric style came down and were secured between two horizontal beams at the eaves, the united ends of the three beams formed, at first in wood, then imitatively in stone, a triglyph or triply divided surface. Between each triglyph and the next, a space was left as an open window when the roof was of wood or of terracotta tiles. When translucent marble tiles were used, these metopes, or seeing between places, were filled in with marble slabs carved in low relief. In the Ionic style, a band or frieze of reliefs might run around the upper outer walls of the naos or cella. In the 5th century, both forms of relief, metopes and frieze, were often used in the same building, as in the Parthenon. In the pediments, the triangles formed by the gabled roof in front and rear, the sculptor found his greatest opportunity. The figures here might be drawn out in high relief and enlarged for view from below, and the cramped corners or tympana tested the subtlest skill. Finally, the roof itself might be a work of art, with brilliantly colored tiles and decorative rain-disposing acroteria or pinnacle figures rising from the angles of the pediments. All in all, there was probably a surplus of sculpture on the Greek temple, between the columns, along the walls, or within the edifice. The painter also was involved. The temple was colored in whole or in part, along with its statues, moldings, and reliefs. Perhaps we do the Greeks too much honor today when time has worn the paint from their temples and divinities, and fairest strains have lent to the marble natural and incalculable hues that set off the brilliance of the stone under the clear Greek sky. Someday, even contemporary art may become beautiful. The two rival styles achieved grandeur in the 6th century and perfection in the 5th. Geographically, they divided Greece unevenly. Ionic prevailed in Asia and the Aegean, Doric on the mainland and in the west. The salient achievements of 6th century Ionic were the temples of Artemis at Ephesus, of Hera at Samos, and of the Branchidae near Miletus. But only ruins survive of Ionic architecture before Marathon. The finest extant buildings from the 6th century are the older temples of Pestum and Sicily, all in the Doric style. 
The ground plan remains of the great temple built at Delphi between 548 and 512 from the designs of the Corinthian Spintheris. It was destroyed by earthquake in 373, was rebuilt on the same plan, and in that form still stood when Pausanias made his tour of Greece. Athenian architecture of the period was almost wholly Doric. In this style, Pisistratus began, about 530, the gigantic temple of the Olympian Zeus, on the plain at the foot of the Acropolis. After the Persian conquest of Ionia in 546, hundreds of Ionian artists migrated to Attica and introduced or developed the Ionic style in Athens. By the end of the century, Athenian architects were using both orders and had laid all the technical groundwork for the Periclean Age. 4. Music and the Dance The word musike among the Greeks meant originally any devotion to any muse. Plato's academy was called a museon, or museum, that is, a place dedicated to the muses and the many cultural pursuits which they patronized. The museum at Alexandria was a university of literary and scientific activity, not a collection of museum pieces. In the narrower and modern sense, music was at least as popular among the Greeks as it is among ourselves today. In Arcadia, all freemen studied music to the age of thirty. Everyone knew some instrument, and to be unable to sing was accounted a disgrace. Lyric poetry was so named because, in Greece, it was composed to be sung to the accompaniment of the lyre, the harp, or the flute. The poet usually wrote the music as well as the words and sang his own songs. To be a lyric poet in ancient Greece was far more difficult than to compose, as poets do today, verses for silent and solitary reading. Before the sixth century, there was hardly any Greek literature divorced from music. Education and letters, as well as religion and war, were bound up with music. Martial airs played an important part in military training, and nearly all instruction of the memory was through verse. By the 8th century, Greek music was already old, with hundreds of varieties and forms. The instruments were simple, and were based, like our vaster armory of sound, upon percussion, wind, or strings. The first class was not popular. The flute was favored at Athens until Alcibiades, laughing at his music master's inflated cheeks, refused to play so ridiculous an instrument, and set a fashion against it among Athenian youth. Besides, said the Athenians, the Boeotians surpassed them with the flute, which branded the art as a vulgar one. The simple flute, or aulus, was a tube of cane or board wood with a detachable mouthpiece, and from two to seven finger holes into which movable stopples might be inserted to modify the pitch. Some players used the double flute, a masculine or bass flute in the right hand and a feminine or treble flute in the left, both held to the mouth by a strap around the cheeks, and played in simple harmony. By attaching the flute to a distensible bag, the Greeks made a bagpipe. By uniting several graduated flutes, they made a syrinx, or a pipe of pan. By extending and opening the end and closing the finger holes, they made a salpinx, or trumpet. Flute music, says Pausanias, was usually gloomy and was always used in dirges or elegies. But the alatridae, the flute-playing geisha girls of Greece, do not seem to have pervaded gloom. String music was confined to plucking the strings with finger or plectrum. Bowing was unknown. The lyre, forming, or kithra were essentially alike. Four or more strings of sheep gut stretched over a bridge across a resonant body of metal or tortoise shell. The kithra was a small harp used for accompanying narrative poetry. The lyre was like a guitar and was chosen to accompany lyric poetry and songs. The Greeks told many strange tales of how the gods, Hermes, Apollo, Athena, had invented these instruments, how Apollo had pitted his lyre against the pipes and flutes of Marcius, a priest of the Phrygian goddess Sibylle, had won, unfairly as Marcius thought, by adding his voice to the instrument, and had topped the performance by having poor Marcius flayed alive. So legend personified the conquest of the flute by the lyre. Prettier stories were told of ancient musicians who had established or developed the musical art, of Olympus, Marcius's pupil, who towards 730 invented the enharmonic scale, of Linus, Heracles's teacher, who invented Greek musical notation and established some of the modes, of Orpheus, Thracian priest of Dionysus, and of his pupil, Musaeus, who said that song is a sweet thing to mortals. These tales reflect the probable fact that Greek music derived its forms from Lydia, Phrygia, and Thrace. The music of Hellas was played in a variety of scales far more numerous and complex than ours. Our diatonic scale makes no smaller division than the halftone, and twelve halftones constitute our octave. The Greeks used quarter tones and had forty-five scales of eighteen notes apiece. These scales were in three groups, 
the diatonic scales based upon the tetrachord E, D, C, and B, the chromatic upon E, C sharp, C, and B, and the enharmonic upon E, C, C flat, and B. From the Greek scales by simplification came those of medieval church music and through these our own. Within the diatonic tetrachord, seven modes, or harmonii, were produced by tuning the strings to alter the position of the semitones in the octave. The most important modes were the Dorian, E, F, G, A, B, C, D, and E, martial and grave, though in a minor key, the Lydian, C, D, E, F, G, A, B, and C, tender and plaintive, though in a major key, and the Phrygian, D, E, F, G, A, B, C, and D minor in key, and orgiastically passionate and wild. It is amusing to read of the violent controversies concerning the musical, ethical, and medical effects, restorative or disastrous, which the Greeks, chiefly the philosophers, ascribed to these half-tone variations. Dorian music, we are told, made men brave and dignified. The Lydian made them sentimental and weak. The Phrygian made them excited and headstrong. Plato saw effeminate luxury and gross immorality as the offspring of most music, and wished to banish all instrumental performances from his ideal state. Aristotle would have had all youths trained in the Dorian mode. Theophrastus had a good word to say even for the Phrygian mode. Serious diseases, he tells us, can be made painless by playing a Phrygian air near the affected part. Greek musical notation used not ovals and stems on a staff of lines, but the letters of the alphabet, buried by inversion or transversion, augmented by dots and dashes to make sixty-four signs, and placed above the words of the song. A few scraps of such notation have come down to console us for the loss of the rest. They indicate melodies akin rather to Oriental than to European strains, and would be more bearable to the Hindus, the Chinese, or the Japanese than to our dull Occidental ears, untrained to quarter tones. Song entered into almost every phase of Greek life. There were dithyrams for Dionysus, paeans for Apollo, hymns for any god, there were encomia, or songs of praise, for rich men, and epinikia, or songs of victory, for athletes. There were symposiaca, scolia, erotica, hymenioi, elegiae, and threnoi, for dining, drinking, loving, marrying, mourning, and burying. Herdsmen had their bucolica, reapers their latyrases, vine dressers their epilenia, spinners their euloi, weavers their elenoi. And then, as now, presumably, the man in the market or the club, the lady in the home and the woman of the streets, sang songs not quite as learned as Simonides's, vulgar music and polite music, have come down distantly together through the centuries. The highest form of music, in the belief and practice of the Greeks, was choral singing. To this they gave the philosophical depth, the structural complexity, the emotional range, which in modern music tend to find place in the concerto or the symphony. Any festival— a harvest, a victory, a marriage, a holy day, might be celebrated with a chorus, and now and then cities and groups would organize great contests in choral song. The performance was in most cases prepared far in advance. A composer was appointed to write the words and music, a rich man was persuaded to pay the expense, professional singers were engaged, and the chorus was carefully trained. All the singers sang the same note as in the music of the Greek church today. There was no part song, except that in later centuries the accompaniment was played a fifth above or below the voice, or ran counter to it. This is as near as the Greeks seem to have come to harmony and counterpoint. The dance, in its highest development, was woven into one art with choral singing, just as many forms and terms of modern music were once associated with the dance. And dancing rivaled music in age and popularity among the Greeks. Lucian, unable to trace its earthly beginnings, sought the origins of the dance in the regular motions of the stars. Homer tells us not only of the dancing floor made by Daedalus for Ariadne, but of an expert dancer among the Greek warriors at Troy, Marianes, who, dancing while he fought, could never be found by any lance. Plato described orcasis, or dancing, as the instinctive desire to explain words by gestures of the entire body, which is rather a description of certain modern languages. Aristotle better defined the dance as an imitation of actions, characters, and passions by means of postures and rhythmical movements. Socrates himself danced and praised the art as giving health to every part of the body. He meant, of course, Greek dancing. For the Greek dance was quite different from ours. 
though in some of its forms it may have served as a sexual stimulant, it rarely brought men into physical contact with women. It was an artistic exercise rather than a walking embrace, and like the Oriental dance it used arms and hands as much as legs and feet. Its forms were as varied as the types of poetry and song. Ancient authorities listed two hundred. There were religious dances, as among the Dionysiac devotees. There were athletic dances, like Sparta's Gymnopedia, or Festival of Naked Youth. There were martial dances, like the Pyrrhic, taught to children as part of military drill. There was the stately Hyperchema, a choral hymn or play performed by two choirs, of which one alternately sang or danced while the other danced or sang. There were folk dances for every major event of life and every season or festival of the year. And as for everything else, there were dance contests, usually involving choral song. All these arts, lyric poetry, song, instrumental music, and the dance, were closely allied in early Greece, and formed in many ways one art. As time went on, and already in the seventh century, specialization and professionalism set in. The rhapsodes abandoned song for recitation, and separated narrative verse from music. Archilochus sang his lyrics without accompaniment and began that long degeneration which at last reduced poetry to a fallen angel silent and confined. The choral dance broke up into singing without dancing and dancing without singing, for, as Lucian put it, the violent exercise caused shortness of breath, and the song suffered for it. In like manner there appeared musicians who played without singing and won the applause of devotees by their precise and rapid execution of quarter tones. Some famous musicians, then as now, engrossed the receipts, Amebius, harpist and singer, received a talent, or six thousand dollars, each time that he performed. The common player doubtless lived from hand to mouth, for the musician, like other artists, belongs to a profession that has had the honor of starving in every generation. The highest tribute went to those who, like Terpander, Orion, Alcman, or Stesichorus, were skilled in all forms, and wove choral song, instrumental music, and the dance into a complex and harmonious whole, probably more profoundly beautiful and satisfying, than the operas and orchestras of today. The most famous of these masters was Orion. About him the Greeks told the tale how, on a voyage from Terrace to Corinth, the sailors stole his money, and then gave him a choice between being stabbed to death or drowned. Having sung a final song, he dived into the sea, and was carried on the back of a dolphin, perhaps his harp, to the shore. It was he who, chiefly at Corinth and towards the close of the seventh century, transformed the inebriated singers of impromptu Dionysiac dithyrams into a sober and trained cycle chorus of fifty voices, singing in strophe and antistrophe with arias and recitatives as in our oratorios. The theme was usually the suffering and death of Dionysus, and in honor of the god's traditional attendance the chorus was dressed in goat-like satyr guise. Out of this, in fact and name, came the tragic theater of the Greeks. 5. The Beginnings of the Drama The sixth century, already distinguished in so many fields and lands, crowned its accomplishments by laying the foundations of the drama. It was one of the creative moments in history. Never before, so far as we know, had men passed from pantomime or ritual to the spoken and secular play. Comedy, says Aristotle, developed out of those who led the phallic procession. A company of people carrying sacred phalli and singing dithyrams to Dionysus or hymns to some other vegetation god, constituted, in Greek terminology, a kamos, or revel. Sex was essential, for the culmination of the ritual was a symbolic marriage aimed at the magic stimulation of the soil. Hence in early Greek comedy, as in most modern comedies and novels, marriage and presumptive procreation form the proper ending of the tale. The comic drama of Greece remained till Menander obscene, because its origin was frankly phallic, it was in its beginnings a joyous celebration of reproductive powers, and sexual restraints were in some measure removed. It was a day's moratorium on morals. Free speech, parousia, was then particularly free, and many of the paraders, dressed in Dionysian satyr style, wore a goat's tail and a large artificial phallus of red leather as part of their costume. This garb became traditional on the comic stage. It was a matter of sacred custom, religiously observed in Aristophanes. Indeed, the phallus continued to be the inseparable emblem of the clown until the fifth century of our era in the West and the last century of the Byzantine Empire in the East. Along with the phallus in the old comedy went the licentious Cordax dance. Strange to say, it was in Sicily that the rustic vegetation revel was first transformed into the comic drama. 
About 560, one Caesarian of Megara Hyblia, near Syracuse, developed the processional mirth into brief plays of rough satire and comedy. From Sicily, the new art passed into the Peloponnesus and then into Attica. Comedies were performed in the villages by traveling players or local amateurs. A century passed before the authorities, to quote Aristotle's phrase, treated the comic drama seriously enough to give it, in 465 B.C., a chorus for representation at an official festival. Tragedy, Tragoidia, or the Goat Song, arose in like manner from the mimic representations in dancing and song of satyr-like Dionysian revelers dressed in the costume of goats. These satyr plays remained till Euripides an essential part of the Dionysian drama. Each composer of a tragic trilogy was expected to make a concession to ancient custom by offering as the fourth part of his presentation a satyr play in honor of Dionysus. Being a development of the satyr play, says Aristotle, it was quite late before tragedy rose from short plots and comic diction to its full dignity. Doubtless other seeds matured in the birth of tragedy. Perhaps it took something from the ritual worship and appeasement of the dead. But essentially its source lay in mimetic religious ceremonies, like the representation in Crete of the birth of Zeus, or in Argos and Samos, his symbolic marriage with Hera, or in Eleusis and elsewhere the sacred mysteries of Demeter and Persephone, or above all in the Peloponnesus and Attica, the mourning and rejoicing over the death and resurrection of Dionysus. Such representations were called dramina, things performed. Drama is a kindred word and means, as it should, an action. At Sicyon, tragic choruses, till the days of the dictator Cleisthenes, commemorated, we are told, the sufferings of Adrastus, the ancient king. At Icaria, where Thespis grew up, a goat was sacrificed to Dionysus. Perhaps the goat song, from which tragedy derived its name, was a chant sung over the dismembered symbol or embodiment of the drunken god. The Greek drama, like ours, grew out of religious ritual. Hence the Athenian drama, tragic and comic, was performed as part of the festival of Dionysus, under the presidency of his priests, in a theater named after him by players called the Dionysian Artists. The statue of Dionysus was brought to the theater and so placed before the stage that he might enjoy the spectacle. The performance was preceded by the sacrifice of an animal to the god. The theater was endowed with the sanctity of a temple, and offenses committed there were punished severely as sacrileges rather than merely as crimes. Just as tragedy held the place of honor on the stage at the city Dionysia, so comedy held the foreground at the festival of the Linnea, but this festival too was Dionysian. Perhaps originally the theme, as in the drama of the Mass, was the passion and death of the god. Gradually the poets were allowed to substitute the sufferings and death of a hero in Greek myth. It may even be that in its early forms the drama was a magic ritual, designed to avert the tragedies it portrayed and to purge the audience of evils, in a more than Aristotelian sense, by representing these as born and finished with by proxy. In part it was this religious basis that kept Greek tragedy on a higher plane than that of the Elizabethan stage. The chorus, as developed for mimetic action by Orion and others, became the foundation of dramatic structure, and remained an essential part of Greek tragedy until the later plays of Euripides. The earlier dramatists were called dancers because they made their plays chiefly a matter of choral dancing, and were actually teachers of dancing. Only one thing was needed to turn these choral representations into dramas, and that was the opposition of an actor in dialogue and action to the chorus. This inspiration came to one of these dancing instructors and chorus trainers, Thespis of Icaria, a town close to the Peloponnesian Megara, where the rites of Dionysus were popular, and not far from Eleusis, where the ritual drama of Demeter, Persephone, and Dionysus Zagrus was annually performed. Helped, no doubt, by the egoism that propels the world, Thespis separated himself from the chorus, gave himself individual recitative lines, developed the notion of opposition and conflict, and offered the drama in its stricter sense to history. He played various roles with such verisimilitude that when his troupe performed at Athens, Solon was shocked at what seemed to him a kind of public deceit, and denounced this newfangled art as immoral, a charge that it has heard in every century. Pisistratus was more imaginative and encouraged the competitive performance of dramas at the Dionysian festival. In 534 Thespis won the victory in such a contest. The new form developed so rapidly that Kyrillus, only a generation later, produced 160 plays. When, fifty years after Thespis, Aeschylus and Athens returned victorious from the Battle of Salamis, the stage was set for the Great Age in the history of the Greek drama. 6. Retrospect 
Looking back upon the multifarious civilization whose peaks have been sketched in the foregoing pages, we begin to understand what the Greeks were fighting for at Marathon. We picture the Aegean as a beehive of busy, quarrelsome, alert, inventive Greeks, establishing themselves obstinately in every port, developing their economy from tillage to industry and trade, and already creating great literature, philosophy, and art. It is amazing how quickly and widely this new culture matured, laying in the sixth century all the foundations for the achievements of the fifth. It was a civilization in certain respects finer than that of the Periclean period, superior in epic and lyric poetry, enlivened and adorned by the greater freedom and mental activity of women, and in some ways better governed than in the later and more democratic age. But even of democracy the bases had been prepared. By the end of the century, the dictatorships had taught Greece enough order to make possible Greek liberty. The realization of self-government was something new in the world. Life without kings had not yet been dared by any great society. Out of this proud sense of independence, individual and collective, came a powerful stimulus to every enterprise of the Greeks. It was their liberty that inspired them to incredible accomplishments in arts and letters, in science and philosophy. It is true that a large part of the people then as always harbored and loved superstitions, mysteries, and myths. Men must be consoled. Despite this, Greek life had become unprecedentedly secular. Politics, law, literature, and speculation had one by one been separated and liberated from ecclesiastical power. Philosophy had begun to build a naturalistic interpretation of the world and man, of body and soul. Science, almost unknown before, had made its first bold formulations. The elements of Euclid were established. Clarity and order and honesty of thought had become the ideal of a saving minority of men. A heroic effort of flesh and spirit rescued these achievements, and the promise they held from the dead hand of alien despotism and the darkness of the mysteries, and won for European civilization the trying privilege of freedom. Chapter 10. The Struggle for Freedom 1. Marathon In the reigns of Darius Xerxes and Artaxerxes, says Herodotus, Greece suffered more sorrows than in twenty generations before. The Greek nation had to pay the penalty of its development. Spreading everywhere, it was bound sooner or later to come into conflict with a major power. Using water as their highway, the Hellenes had opened up a trade route that extended from the eastern coast of Spain to the farthest ports of the Black Sea. This European water route, Greco-Italian-Sicilian, competed more and more with the Oriental land and water route, Indo-Perso-Phoenician, and thereby arose a lasting and bitter rivalry, in which war, by all human precedents, was inevitable, and in which the battles of Lady, Marathon, Plataea, Himera, Mycale, the Eurymedon, the Granicus, Isis, Arbila, Cani, and Zema were merely incidents. The European system won against the Oriental partly because transport by water is cheaper than transport by land, and partly because it is almost a law of history that the rugged, warlike North conquers the easy-going, art-creating South. In the year 512, Darius I of Persia crossed the Bosporus, invaded Scythia, and marching westward conquered Thrace and Macedon. When he returned to his capitals, he had enlarged his realm to embrace Persia, Afghanistan, northern India, Turkestan, Mesopotamia, northern Arabia, Egypt, Cyprus, Palestine, Syria, Asia Minor, the eastern Aegean, Thrace, and Macedonia. The greatest empire that the world has yet seen had overextended itself to include and awaken its future conqueror. Only one important nation remained outside this vast system of government and trade, and that was Greece. By 510, Darius had hardly heard of it outside Ionia. The Athenians, he asked, who are they? About 506, the dictator Hippias, deposed by revolution at Athens, fled to the Persian satrap at Sardis, begged for help in regaining his power, and offered in that event to hold Attica under the Persian dominion. To this temptation there was added in 500 a timely provocation. The Greek cities of Asia Minor, under Persian rule for half a century, suddenly dismissed their satraps and declared their independence. Aristagoras of Miletus went to Sparta to enlist its aid without success. He passed on to Athens, mother city of many Ionian towns, and pleaded so well that the Athenians sent a fleet of twenty ships to support the revolt. Meanwhile, the Ionians were acting with a chaotic vigor characteristic of the Greeks. Each rebel city raised its own troops, but kept them under separate command and the Milesian army, led with more bravery than wisdom, marched upon Sardis and burned the great city to the ground. The Ionian confederacy organized a united fleet, but the Samian contingent secretly made terms with the Persian satrap, 
and when in 494 the Persian navy met the Ionian at Lady, in one of the major sea battles of history, the half-hundred ships of the Sanians sailed away without fighting, and many other contingents followed their example. The defeat of the Ionians was complete, and Ionian civilization never quite recovered from this physical and spiritual disaster. The Persians laid siege to Miletus, captured it, killed the males, enslaved the women and children, and so completely plundered the city that Miletus became from that day a minor town. Persian rule was re-established throughout Ionia, and Darius, resentful of Athenian interference, resolved to conquer Greece. Little Athens, as the result of her generous assistance to her daughter cities, found herself face to face with an empire literally a hundred times greater than Attica. In the year 491, a Persian fleet of 600 ships under Datus struck across the Aegean from Samos, stopped on the way to subdue the Cyclades, and reached the coast of Euboea with 200,000 men. Euboea submitted after a brief struggle, and the Persians crossed the bay to Attica. They pitched their camp near Marathon, because Hippias had advised them that in the plain they could use their cavalry, in which they were overwhelmingly superior to the Greeks. All Greece was in turmoil at the news. The Persian arms had never yet been defeated, the advance of the empire had never yet been stopped. How could a nation so weak, so scattered, so unused to unity hold back this wave of oriental conquest? The northern Greek states were loath to resist so monstrous a power. Sparta hesitatingly prepared, but allowed superstition to delay its mobilization. Little Plataea acted quickly, and sent a large proportion of its citizens by forced marches to Marathon. At Athens, Miltiades freed and enlisted slaves as well as freemen, and led them over the mountains to the battlefield. When the rival armies met, the Greeks had some twenty thousand men, the Persians probably one hundred thousand. The Persians were brave, but they were accustomed to individual fighting, and were not trained for the mass defense and attack of the Greeks. The Greeks united discipline with courage, and though they committed the folly of dividing the command among ten generals, each supreme for a day, they were saved by the example of Aristides, who yielded his leadership to Miltiades. Under this blunt soldier's vigorous strategy, the small Greek force routed the Persian horde in what was not only one of the decisive battles, but also one of the most incredible victories of history. If we may accept Greek testimony on such a matter, 6,400 Persians, but only 192 Greeks fell at Marathon. After the battle was over, the Spartans arrived, mourned their tardiness, and praised the victors. 2. Aristides and Themistocles the strange mixture of nobility and cruelty, idealism and cynicism in Greek character and history, was illustrated by the subsequent careers of Miltiades and Aristides. Inflated by the praise of all Greece, Miltiades asked the Athenians to equip a fleet of seventy ships to be under his unchecked command. When the ships were ready, Miltiades led them to Peros and demanded of its citizens one hundred talents, or six hundred thousand dollars, on pain of wholesale death. The Athenians recalled him and fined him fifty talents, but Miltiades died soon after, and the fine was paid by his son Simon, the future rival of Pericles. The man who had yielded place to him at Marathon survived the pitfalls of success. Aristides was in life and manners a Spartan at Athens. His quiet, staid character, his modest simplicity and undiscourageable honesty won him the title of the just, and when in a drama of Aeschylus's the passage occurred, for not at seeming just but being so, he aims, and from his depth of soil below harvests of wise and prudent counsels grow. All the audience turned to look at Aristides as the living embodiment of the poet's lines. When the Greeks captured the camp of the Persians at Marathon and found great wealth in their tents, Aristides was left in charge of it and neither took anything for himself nor suffered others to do it. And when, after the war, the allies of Athens were induced to contribute annually to the treasury of Delos as a fund for common defense, Aristides was chosen by them to fix their payments, and none protested his decisions. Nevertheless, he was more admired than popular. Though a close friend of Cleisthenes, who had so extended democracy, he was of the opinion that democracy had gone far enough, and that any further empowerment of the assembly would lead to administrative corruption and public disorder. He exposed malfeasance, wherever he found it, and made many enemies. The Democratic Party, led by Themistocles, used Cleisthenes's recently established device of ostracism to get rid of him, and in 482 the only man in Athenian history that was at once famous and honest was exiled at the height of his career. All the world knows, though again it may only be a fable, 
how Aristides inscribed his own name on the Ostracon for a letterless citizen who did not know him, but who, with the resentment of mediocrity for excellence, was tired of hearing him called the just. When Aristides learned of the decision, he expressed the hope that Athens would never have occasion to remember him. The historian is constrained to admit that the public men of Athens were properly equipped with the unscrupulousness that sometimes enters into statesmanship. As much as Alcibiades at a later age, Themistocles was a very flame of ability. He has a claim on our admiration quite extraordinary and unparalleled, says the always moderate Thucydides. Like Miltiades, he saved Athens but could not save himself. He could defeat a great empire but not his own lust for power. He received reluctantly and carelessly, says Plutarch, instructions given him to improve his manners and behavior or to teach him any pleasing or graceful accomplishment. But whatever was said to improve him in sagacity or in the management of affairs, he would give attention to beyond his years, confident in his natural capacity for such things. It was Athens's misfortune that both Themistocles and Aristides fell in love with the same girl, Stesileus of Chaos, and that their animosity outlived the beauty that had aroused it. Nevertheless, it was Themistocles whose foresight and energy prepared for and carried through the victory of Salamis, the most crucial battle in Greek history. As far back as 493, he had planned and begun a new harbor for Athens at the Piraeus. Now, in 482, he persuaded the Athenians to forego a distribution of money due them from the proceeds of the silver mines at Lorium, and to devote the sum to the building of a hundred triremes. Without this fleet, there could have been no resistance to Xerxes. 3. Xerxes Darius I died in 485 and was succeeded by Xerxes I. Both father and son were men of ability and culture, and it would be an error to think of the Greco-Persian War as a contest between civilization and barbarism. When Darius, before invading Greece, sent heralds to Athens and Sparta to demand earth and water as symbols of submission, both cities had put the heralds to death. Troubled by portents, Sparta now repented of this violation of international custom and asked for two citizens to go to Persia and surrender themselves to any punishment that the great king might exact in retribution. Sperthius and Bulus, both of old and wealthy families, volunteered, made their way to Xerxes and offered to die in atonement for the killing of Darius's messengers. Xerxes, says Herodotus, answered with true greatness of soul that he would not act like the Lacedaemonians, who by killing the heralds had broken the laws which all men held in common. As he had blamed such conduct in them, he would never be guilty of it himself. Xerxes prepared leisurely but thoroughly for the second Persian attack upon Greece. For four years he collected troops and materials from all the provinces of his realm, and when in 481 he at last set forth, his army was probably the largest ever assembled in history before our own century. Herodotus reckoned it without moderation at 2,641,000 fighting men and an equal number of engineers, slaves, merchants, provisioners, and prostitutes. He tells us, with perhaps a twinkle in his eye, that when Xerxes's army drank water, whole rivers ran dry. It was, naturally and fatally, a highly heterogeneous force. There were Persians, Medes, Babylonians, Afghans, Indians, Bactrians, Sogdians, Sassi, Assyrians, Armenians, Colchians, Scythes, Peonians, Mysians, Paphlagonians, Phrygians, Thracians, Thessalians, Locrians, Boeotians, Aeolians, Ionians, Lydians, Carians, Cilicians, Cypriots, Phoenicians, Syrians, Arabians, Egyptians, Ethiopians, Libyans, and many more. There were footmen, cavalrymen, chariots, elephants, and a fleet of transports.